God is good, amen? amen? It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Today I want to talk to you about three chairs. Let's pray. Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, God, I thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. God, you are so good. I thank you for this great, great congregation that we have here today. I pray, Lord, that you would bless them and touch them, oh God, in a mighty way. You are good and wonderful and kind. I love you today, and I thank you for all that you are. Bless me as a man of God as I speak your word. I love you today. Thank you, Lord God, today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> today I want to talk to you about three chairs. Joshua 24, 15 says, if, And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell. But as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24 presents a detailed account of the faithfulness of God to his people. They have entered into the promised land, and God is in the process of establishing the ground rules for living in his promised land. Amen. In a very powerful moment, Joshua challenges the people with these famous words, Choose ye this day who you will serve. There are three chairs in the world, and those three chairs represent represents three kinds of people. People of commitment, people of compromise, and people of conflict. People of commitment are sold out to Jesus. People of compromise or acquaintances of Jesus living distant from him, they are lukewarm and many times are living a carnal life. People of conflict are unsaved, unchurched, uninterested in God. They know that there is a God somewhere, but they are still searching for him. Amen. The search for the truth is leading them to an inner and outer conflict. Because they were created and created with a deep desire to be reconciled with God. But right now they are refusing to know God. The committed people is the first chair person who is, in a, a tremendous, who is a tremendous Christian. They are sold out to the Lord. They are dedicated and they are under authority and leadership of the Holy Spirit. They are doing everything they know to do to draw closer to God. And they are not easily detoured or discouraged. They walk by faith and not by sight. How many in this house is walking by faith and not by sight? Amen. The number two person, the compromised person, is the second chair person who represents a person who has many basic, who has many basic Bible beliefs. They have experienced the new life. They may have been born again. They say they believe in the Bible and God's word, but there's a difference between the first chair Christian and the second chair Christian. The second chair Christian has some inconsistencies in their walk and are double-minded and unstable. They're double-minded, having one foot in the church and one foot in the world. They do not have the same commitment level, and it shows. The reason why they, they don't have what the committed person have can be summed up in one word, compromise. Compromise. We watch those that are committed to God, and we say, man, I want what that person has. But when we compromise, we can't have what they have. See, there's something holding us, us back from God's very best. And the phone said, <laughs> no, no, thank you. Compromise means, check this out, <laughs> to settle a dispute with someone, with someone else by lowering your standards or morals. Woo. That's what it is. You make a settlement. Okay. I'm going to lower my standard and morals so I can hang out with you. Oh, boy. 
The number three person is the conflict person. It represents the third chair person who does not confess to be a Christian. They're not in a right relationship with God. And they would not deny that fact. Oftentimes they will confess that they believe in God, but deny that Jesus is the only path to salvation. They presently have no walk or relationship with God, and they are just freestyling with their life. Whatever happens, happens. And then they make a joke about even going to hell. But let me tell you, hell is no joke. Just one bar big barbecue, and you don't want to be invited. You can sum up their walk in their life with one compound word. Inner conflict. There's an inner conflict going on with that third chair person who won't believe. There's a constant conflict in there. Because you know why there's a conflict? Because God has already put something in them that want God. But the world in them is conflicting, and that's why they're always going. That's why most people you see. That are that the, that's that third chair person. They're very angry all the time. And if you mention anything about God, it's like, right? They're so mad because there's a conflict going on. They are in conflict by the way they live. They do not know God. They do not serve God. Joshua was sitting in the first chair. He was following God with all of his heart, and he lived a life of commitment. When he challenged the elders, they said they would live by the same commitment towards God. Right before he died, he called all the people together, and he wanted them to make a recommitment to God. He called all the people together, said, come on, let's make this recommitment. And all of the elders got together, and Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And they said, we will serve the Lord too. But after Joshua died, the elders moved from the first chair of commitment to the second chair of compromise. All they were supposed to do when Joshua died was drive out the rest of the inhabitants that was in the land. The battle was already won. God says, I'm already going to give you the victory. If you don't compromise, if you will serve me with all your heart, you are going to have the victory. All you got to do is go in and begin to drive them out. All they had to do was separate themselves from the enemy and the gods that they was, that they was worshiping. But Ephraim did not drive them out, one of the tribes, nor did Zebulon drive them out, nor did the tribes of Israel drive them out. In other words, they struck a compromise with the enemies of God. Instead of them uh, following God and, and, and doing what he told them to do and, and taking the land, instead they want to do the work. They didn't want to do what it took to, to get the blessing, so they just stopped and they compromised. Let's look at the great promise God gave to the children of Israel in Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. I'm actually going to read 1 to 3. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am given to them the children of Israel, and every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. It's the same blessing. Keep on going on, even though Moses had passed. Now let's look at what God said. He says, everywhere you go, everywhere you walk, everywhere the sole of your footstep, I'm going to give you that land for possession. So at this point, the children of Israel are in control on how much land they possess. They was in control. Because they had God backing them up. They had God backing them up. Verse 
God in his covenant through his word has unconditionally given them the right to have all of the land. Wherever you go, wherever you walk, wherever the sole of your foot tread, you can have it for a possession. It was the covenant of no limits. The covenant of no limits. What could I do if God told me that? My God. What could we accomplish as a church if God told us that? Everywhere you go, everything you do, everywhere you place your feet, I'm going to bless you. What could we do? Hmm. Sadly, according to historians, God promised the Israelites over 300,000 square miles of land. History tells us that Israel has never at any time possessed more than 30,000 square miles of land. They limited their inheritance and their reward by their own steps. They made a decision that they were only going to go so far and no further. You hear a lot of Christians sometimes that says, this is all I need. You hear it all the time. I don't need anything more than this. But that's not what God is telling you to do. He said, tread. Step. Walk. He told Abraham, look. And as far as you can see, my God, as far as you can see, I'm giving it to you. I'm giving it to you. Hallelujah. But they made a decision that they were only going to go so far and no farther. They were only going to go so much and no more. And they only possess one tenth. One tenth of what God wanted them to have. That's sad, that's sad because God called them to a whole lot more than that. How much is God calling to New Horizons Church? How much does he want us to do? Are we just satisfied with our, just our little what we're doing and we're, we're just happy and we got our little group and we're doing our little thing? How much more does God have for us? How much more? How much more? How much more? But we're not going to find out if we say, oh, no. Do you not know that there was two and a half tribes that didn't even go in the province land? They was outside of the province land. Two and a half tribes. They was like, oh, you know what they said? Oh, this land right here, it looks good enough for me, Chris. I'm good. I don't even need to go over there. Did you see all this water and my cows can eat and everything good? They didn't even go. They didn't even possess their promised land. They were satisfied with just living outside of the promise. Outside of the promise. Their choice. Their choice. And they settled there. And it was comfortable to bear. And God says, okay, you don't want to go get your promise, but you can stay here, but you still got to go and help your brothers fight for theirs. They might as well just went up in that thing swinging. Who's next? Who's next? And just mop the whole place up. Lord. Joshua 1 4, 1 4 and 5 says this. Look what God promised them. Boy, this is powerful. I don't know, but I got a feeling soon God's going to give us a word. Amen. I'm not telling you I know what it is, but I'm feeling something, Brother Chris. Hallelujah. I believe God's going to speak to us and tell us what to do. Amen. Look what he say. Look what God told them. From the wilderness to this Lebanon and as far as the great river, 
the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. God says, everything that I just listed is for you. All he got to do is speak, and it's going to happen. Ain't nobody going to be able to fool with you. It ain't to be arrogant or cocky. It's to be blessed. <laughs> I'm blessed by God. God says the Hittites has got the gold, so they got the gold. We can't be like, oh, I don't want the, I feel bad for the Hittites. No, they was wicked. They didn't want to serve God. They didn't want to do what God wanted them to do. And God says, it's over. That's y'all's now. Hallelujah. It's y'all's now. You can feel sorry for the devil on your promise if you want. But hallelujah, Lionel wants to kick the devil off of his promise. <laughs> hallelujah. We got to kick him off. You got to kick the devil off of your promise. You can't, let the, you can't feel sorry for the devil. I don't care if he comes in the form of the Hittites or the Jebusites or the Gergeshites, or whatever kind of ike. Let me tell you something. Any kind of ike that's on my promise has got to go. you got to go. Got to go. Mm. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For those that are new here to me speaking in tongues, that is in the Bible. But I'm just feeling it right now. Ooh, glory. That is my prayer language. And it can be yours too, right after these messages. <laughs> mm. Whoa, glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 There's something we have to keep on our conscience. When we slide from the first chair to the second chair, it, it makes it easier to slide to the third chair. The third chair always leads into a life that is in direct conflict with God. The devil wants you to be in conflict with God. Not getting close. He's trying to push you away from your stuff. But you need to let everybody go that you know that is so evil and they ain't changing. Get away. Get away from them. Get away from them. No, nah, I'm not hanging with you Jebusites no more. Y'all be jebbing. <laughs> Can't do it. Trying to stop me. The devil trying to stop somebody in this room from getting to your promise. But God has great promises for you. Hallelujah. He got great promises for you, my son. You got to watch them Jebusites. We got to watch them. I'm always watching. You know, they want to attach themselves to you. <laughs> but you're not going to be as blessed attaching yourself to them. We're not. I'm not. They're always trying to attach themselves to me. And I have to be much careful. But God has great promises. Great. Great. Oh, all he got to do is tell you. From here to there and over there and over there is yours. And you can write that thing and cash it in. You can dig a hole in the ground with that promise, put it in the ground and let it grow. And I promise you, because God said it's going to happen, even though it's on a piece of paper, guess what? It's going to happen. I can promise you. Woo! Feeling blessed today. <laughs> yes. Mmm. Three generations removed themselves from the faithful Joshua. 
They had moved from commitment to compromise, to actually having a generation that only served God in name. They were God's called people, but they had no relationship with him. It is like that church in the book of Revelations that said that they had a name that lived, but they were dead. The first chair person sitting in the seat of commitment to Jesus often finds himself at odds with the world. Their value system is different from the world. You can't mix oil and water. It just don't mix real good. Pretty soon you're going to lock your engine up if you pour a gallon of water in the oil. <laughs> but peace with God always trumps over anything that the world has to throw your way. God delivers his people when they are faithful to him, you don't have to worry about what nobody else is doing. You don't have to worry about no threats. You don't have to worry about your enemies. All you got to do is keep yourself right with God and watch God go before you. Hallelujah. Watch God go before you. Isn't that what he did with Israel when he called them out of Egypt? They didn't know where he was going. He said, just follow me. Whenever you see the cloud move, you start moving. Whenever you see the cloud stop, you stop. And that's how you get your victory. When God is moving, you move. When he stopped, you stop. Hmm. Nothing more, nothing less. Sometimes we get impatient. We get impatient. The cloud ain't moving. So you start acting like a cowboy. And you start trying to get a lasso. And you start trying to lasso the cloud. Come on, God. Uh, he got to go before you. The second chair person who sits in the seat of compromise is a person that knows the key points of the Bible. They read the Bible with common sense glasses instead, instead of spiritual glasses. They say you cannot get too religious. They say, I believe in Jesus. They say, I go to church on Sunday morning. I take my family in. That is enough. This person is living a compromise, and carnality is the constant companion of their life. Outwardly and privately, they love their work, but they... But they are not walking in their calling. They are more interested in their career than anything else. The third chair person is a person that is full of worldliness. They fit right into the world and is, do and is doing and they don't see anything wrong with what they're doing. Their definition is nobody has a right to define what's right and wrong in other people's lives. Well, let me tell you something. That is a lie. Let me ask you a question. How do you think the world would be if it had no rules? How would the world be if it had no rules? It'd be grimy. It'd be real grimy. If it didn't have no rules, we would be getting violated every day and you will be violating every day because you really wouldn't have no choice. Because if somebody took all of yours and if everybody taking, guess what? You're going to have to start taking. It'd be real grimy with no rules. I watched a movie years ago where for one day they didn't have no laws. I don't remember what the name of it was, but it was going down. <laughs> They didn't have no laws. <laughs> and it got real grimy. Real grimy. Some years ago when I lived in a different city, I was talking to my neighbor, and he was proud of the fact that he didn't have any rules for his sons. He says he'll just let them grow up, and they'll figure it out when they're grown. And I told him, I says, well, what if they figure out they want to be a mass murderer? 
He says, oh, I didn't think about that. I said, well, you need to start thinking about that because they could grow up and want to just do some, some hellion type stuff. Can't just be in a world with no rules. Can't just not give your kids any instruction. Everybody is sitting in one of these chairs. When you go through the Bible, you see that there is a generational slide all throughout the Old Testament. In the 21st century, we see the same pattern. If I was to secretly <laughs> hand out pieces of paper and ask your children and your spouse what chair you were sitting in, what would they say? Not what you would say. What would your children say? What would your spouse say? Would your spouse say, oh, she's definitely in the third chair? Would she say, he's definitely in the second chair of compromise? What would they say? What would your children say? See, children see things they does not allow to say things. But what would they say? Which chair would your family say that you are sitting in if they could totally be honest? And I'm going to close up with this because I shortened this message up a little bit because of we had so much going on. Come on, Brother Chris. What chair would your family, would, would they say that you're sitting in? This matters because it is a generational challenge. The chair you choose is, is not as much about you as it's also about the future generation and the generation after that. Because every time one generation compromises, it becomes a little easier to go down the tube. What would heaven be like if we chose the third chair? How much promised land would you lose if you chose the second or the third chair? I mean, how much promised land are you losing right now? Do you even know? Stand with me. <clears throat> what are you today? Are you committed? Are you compromised? Or you're just plain old conflicted. What are you today? We're all somewhere. Anybody want to pray about your number? If you do, come on. Oh, God, help us today. Help me, Lord. Come on, the altar is open. Let's, let's talk to God. Come on. Hallelujah.